All right, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 21. We're now hitting toward eternity, as you might notice over here. We're hitting toward eternity, and there is a new heaven and a new earth. And a new Jerusalem. So, New Jerusalem, I'll be explaining a little bit more about its shape. Now, remember, the new earth is given to the nation of Israel primarily. We see that. The new Jerusalem, we see that primarily given to the church. And then we see the new heaven that is given to the Gentile nations. So all the planets, galaxies, outer space, and etc. This is where the Gentiles are going to be spreading out. Thus the new heaven. Alright, this is the Gentiles. Alright, let me know if I'm out of bounds. Now, let's cover a little bit more verse by verse on what's going on. The Bible reads, uh, we left off at verse 8, but the fearful, so anyone who fears, and unbelieving, those who do not believe, and the abominable. Now that definition can be broad because there's a lot of things that are considered to be abomination to God. And you'd be surprised you make up the list. Some people think like really heinous sins as abominable, which is true. But then you get the book of Proverbs that says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So how many times have we lived an unbalanced life, right? right. We always try to find our balance, so that's considered abomination to God. Uh, God, He actually considers dressing uh, that pertains to the opposite sex, that uh, if it's a universal appearance, that is considered abomination to Him as well, actually. That's why Christians make a strong distinction on two different genders, not 50 different colors of the rainbow that they like to make up with the... Ne never mind. Okay, but anyways. So there's a lot of things that are considered abomination to God, actually. So those who committed abominations, they're considered to be abominable. And murderers, so those who kill, who murder. And whoremongers, so that's referring to the male version of prostitutes. So it's instead of a whore, it's a whoremonger, actually. Whoremongers sorcer and sorcerers, so those who are part of the occult, sorcery, witchcraft. And idolaters, those who bow down and worship idols. So that includes the Catholic Church. That also includes uh, Buddhism, Eastern religions, etc. And all liars. Now notice that the Bible says all liars, not just liars, but all liars. Meaning that everyone is a liar, so to speak. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for those of you who don't realize that, go to 1 John 1. Okay, 1 John chapter 1. Keep your hand at Revelation 21. We'll come back here. But go to 1 John chapter 1. So, verse 8 talks about these list of sinners who are going to the lake of fire. It's a famous street preaching and soul winning verse that we use to show people that, hey, you, you are in these lists of sinners, and because of that, you're going to burn in hell after you die. Now, some people might deny it and say, well, I'm not a liar. Well, 1 John chapter 1 says all liars, everyone committed lies. So you can, you can put them in this list here of sinners who go to hell. But in case there's some smart aleck that says I'm not a liar, when he already lied from his mouth from saying that, look at 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, so if you're not a sinner, if you haven't sinned, we make him a what? Liar. liar. So he's automatically a liar, the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All right, let's go back over here. Let's go back over here. Verse 8, uh, Revelation 21, 8, excuse me. That's why I meant by back. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. The next part reads, uh, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. So these people have a part in this lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Now notice it says they have their part, right? 
Meaning then that they have a part and a location in the lake of fire. Which then means over here that the lake of fire, it does have different compartments, so to speak. So when we talk about hell having different compartments and places, that is actually true. Why does this say have their part? Because the Antichrist is in the lake of fire. Uh, the dragon, Satan, he goes to the lake of fire, right? And this lake of fire is eternal. Some people, Seventh-day Adventist Jehovah Witnesses, they try to say that, well, the lake, lake of fire may be for the devil to burn eternally, but not for lost sinners. No, that's not true. It says, shall have their part in the lake of fire. Meaning then, why did the author word it their part? Because he knows that the lake of fire is reserved for Satan. But because they know it's reserved for Satan, that doesn't mean it's only reserved for Satan. They have another part in there. That's for lost sinners. See that? So when the Bible says the devil is tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire, that means he's burning there forever. But it's not just him. Lost sinners have their part to join with him. So that verse is proof to the Seventh-day Adventists and to Jehovah Witnesses too that lost sinners, they do burn eternally in the lake of fire because they have their part with the devil. See that? Yeah. They have their part with him. All right, let's keep reading uh, the next part of verse 8. So uh, it says, burn it with fire and brimstone. So it contains fire and brimstone. So brimstone, it refers to sulfur. But uh, interestingly, that word can also refer to uh, stones of fire, so to speak. So maybe there might be some of that involved. Now it says that verse 8, it says that this lake of fire is the what? Which is the what? Second death. So remember, this is the second death over here. The second death. Remember back at Revelation chapter 20? Those who are part of the first resurrection at verse 6, Revelation 20 verse 6. It says if they're a part of this first resurrection, then what? The second death has no power over them, meaning the lake of fire. Remember, I taught you this before. The first resurrection is for saved people. And that means the second resurrection is for what? It's for lost people. Remember, Revelation 20, verse 6 says, if you're part of the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. Oh, uh oh, then what if you're part of the second resurrection then? And see, then you're part of this second death, so to speak. That second resurrection was already discussed at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. Remember, that's all the lost people coming up and being judged at the great white throne judgment. All right, now let's go back to Revelation chapter 21 verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels. Okay, there comes to John one of these seven angels. Remember these seven angels? Seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues. All right, so remember, if you recall back at Revelation 16 and earlier chapters, that there were seven angels who had seven vials pouring out the last plagues, the final judgments of God upon the earth. So one of those angels, one of those seven, comes to John and what? Keep reading verse 9. Talked with me. He talks to John, saying, come hither. So the angel says, John, come along with me. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So one of these seven angels says to John, come with me. I'm going to show you the lamb's wife. The lamb is referring to Jesus Christ, the wife and bride of Jesus Christ. The Lord's going to show uh, John who the bride is. Now, uh, look at verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit. So, the angel carries John in this spiritual power, in the spirit, to a great and high mountain. Takes him on top of a high mountain and shows him what? Showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. See, remember that New Jerusalem, the holy city New Jerusalem. On top of a mountain, he sees it. Descending out of heaven from God. So remember, I told you before, the New Jerusalem, it comes out of heaven, descends out of heaven, 
and then lands closer toward the earth. Having the glory of God. So this new Jerusalem has the glory of God because for those of you who kind of might recall, if you, we're going to actually look at it at verse 23. And then if you look at verse 23, you'll notice that the glory of God is around this new Jerusalem. See that? There is no glory of the sun, the moon, or some kind of city lights. It's the light of God that shines forth out of the city. That's going to be better than any city lights. If so many people get amazed with the dazzling lights of the city at night, imagine the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. It's going to be phenomenal over there. So that's the reason why it says at verse... Uh, when you go back to Revelation chapter 21, verse 11, it has the glory of God. See that? Because if you read verse 23 over there, uh, it's His glory, His light, not the sun, moon, stars, and its own city light. Okay, it's, so it has the glory of God, and her light, so that's plain, so it's the light referring in the same context to glory of God. Her light was like unto a stone, most precious. So what kind of light will this be, right? The glory of God? It's going to be like a stone that is most precious. What's this most precious stone? Even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So uh, it's going to be like a jasper stone. For some of you who don't know, a jasper stone is in similitude with the diamond back then. So that's why it's clear as crystal. That's why it's clear as crystal. It's transparent because it's all diamond form. That's the light that's going to be shining out of this city, man. That's going to be phenomenal. Diamond lights. Now, notice that uh, this city, uh, New Jerusalem, it's referred to as the lamb's wife and it's referred to as a she. There's this weird false cultic religion, which uh, they call the mother. They believe there is a mother God, so to speak. And unfortunately, it was created in Korea, actually, of all places. I am so ashamed of that. So this Mother God religion, they're really growing, and surprisingly, a few of our members encountered them. They're, they're pretty evangelistic people, actually. So these people, uh, they believe that this Mother God, that if you look at verses uh, 9, 10, and 11, that it is truly a person and that it is not a city. And then if you put it in a city phrase, they would say it's more metaphorical. And then if it's in a she phrase, that that's more of a literal phrase. But we argue the opposite. We argue the opposite that this she and this, uh, that this personified woman would be a metaphorical phrase, whereas the city is more literal. Now, how do we know that? How we know that is very simple. How we know that is, one, you got to realize nations and cities have been known as she even in common sense language. So a lot of people would talk about, uh, you know, some people would talk about Mother Russia, for example, America being our mother country, etc. There are songs about America that would refer to it as a she, uh, as a she phrase. See, so that's in common sense language, actually. City and locations, they would be personified as a she. So that's just common sense. Another thing is this, another thing is, if you actually uh, look at uh, verse 9 all the way through 23, context is perfect. Context demands everything. In context, are the details more personified or are they more objectified as a city? Yeah, context is more object here. It talks about wall, city, gates. Why would it give so much uh, uh, object details more than personified details? If God's going to describe the description of the beauty of the wife, then it would be more in personified details, not in objectified details. Some mother of God cult religions, they'll probably say that all this city description is more like a metaphor describing her beauty and etc. But even in Song of Solomon, where it describes some object to describe the beauty of a wife, it's more personified, not objectified over there. See, so context demands everything. Not only that, look at, uh, it says the Lamb's wife, right? Who is the bride of Jesus Christ? If we look at Ephesians 5, which we looked at last time. It's the church, it's us. 
See, so we are actually the bride of Christ. It's not like that we have a mother God figure. Some of them church of uh, some of these mother God church cults, they'll try to argue that basically that, well, you know, it talks about Jerusalem being the mother of us all. And they'll refer to passages in Galatians and probably Hebrews 12 for that one. But actually, the reason why that we call Jerusalem the mother of us all is simple. It's like our mother country, our mother homeland. See, that's where we belong. It's that simple. How do we know that? Because that's found in common sense language. We all use that. 